Hey, um, why don't we just go ahead and get started? It's 11 o'clock and you know we have a lot to discuss here. Um, just real quickly, uh, my name is Dave Meyer. I'm starting my alarm clock here so I don't talk too long. Um, I am currently with NASA. I'm the head of the Goddard uh, Earth Sciences Data and Information Services Center. That's a big, long, a jazz disk. Uh, I worked with the USGS for a number of years, but my interest, my particular interest here, you know, is um, having some work back when I worked with the U.S. Geological Survey in South Dakota, you know, as part of the work I'd done at the Aeros Data Center. You know, I had worked a lot with tribal communities out there and, um, and uh, th this whole idea of like, Climate preparedness and resilience is very important. You know, it's one thing if you're the city of New York or Los Angeles or some, you know, Washington, D.C. or something like that to have a community of folks, you know, who can address these things. But when you live in small states like my former state of South Dakota, like my current state of Vermont, you know, you have to come up with a different model. OK, and so one of the things you wanted to do is make sure that, you know, the kinds of technologies and data access and policies, things that we talk about here at uh, at ESIP, are things that can you know benefit you know these smaller communities that might not have all the resources required to uh, you know to uh, um, address these issues. All right. So um, after working with USGS for a number of years, I worked at NASA headquarters for a little while with Kevin Murphy, and I was the lead on as NASA's leads on a climate data initiative, uh, the CDI, and uh, along with our NOAA you know uh, uh, partners, you know we uh, we were looking at ways of making sure that federal data was more understandable and accessible okay and one of the things that kind of came out of that you know we're federal agencies you know nasa's you know loves technology right and so uh we like to build things okay and we go out there and we see these communities that say okay these end use communities we're going to build stuff for them and that's a very good thing to do and we work with our applications groups to do that but one of the things we learned too is like sometimes if you need to reach you know uh the folks that don't necessarily have access to these technologies you also want to make sure you enable the enablers. Okay, so that's an important activity as well. So we're not just building things for these end use communities. We're trying to build things that other people come in and build on. Okay, so that's a, you know, that's a that's a pretty uh, that's a pretty important um, you know thing to keep in mind as as we're doing this as a federal agency. Um, one of the things that I learned in working with the tribal communities out west is you know we did capacity building. Okay, you know a commonly used term. Um, and so I would go out to Rosebud Reservation and say, oh, look at all this cool stuff we can do, we can help you with. And of course, one of the tribal elders comes up to me and says, so let me guess, you're with the government and you're here to help, right? Okay, you got me. All right. But, you know, but you do need to go out and you need to learn about these things. But a lot of times you have to work through people that already engage these communities. Um, so we have a really good cast of folks here uh, today. Um, let's see, forward. A little bit of a lag here, I guess. Oh, there we are. Okay. Um, so here, here's the, the panel that we have here. I'm just going to be really brief so they can get it and talk about it. Uh, we have uh, myself. I just introduced myself. We have Shruti uh, Modukirti. Ah, okay. There we go. Uh, and she is one of the fellows here, you know, that, that uh, Susan mentioned earlier, and she's been helping orchestrate this. You know, she is thinking about a similar session. You know, and she comes from a you know a background of urban planning, and um, I'm sorry, I <laughs> the wrong one here. Um, give me one second here; my notes are in. So she, she has a lot of background in this area. So she's going to um, excuse me. I'm trying to manage a phone and a thing, and I need my eyes. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, this is, here it is. Where do we move these things to? This is Windows, right? Just make it big. Okay, make it okay, big. Thank you. No worries. <laughs> ah, there we go. Next slide. Okay. So you know, she, she's been basically been orchestrating the session. She has the very some mature ideas how to do this with the breakout sessions we're going to be talking about. And so she'll be going into a little bit more detail on that as she speaks. We have Robert Cheatham right here. Okay, if you guys want to just kind of wave back so people know who you are. He's sitting right in front of me. Um, he's with Element 84. You know, he was, uh, uh, you know, the founder of Avesa. Azavia. Azavia, okay. And now Azavia is bought up by Element uh, 84, and he's our... You know, uh, uh, head technologist there. We have Leslie Ann uh, Dupigny-Giraud. Did I say that? Am I even close? 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> My daughter speaks French much better than me, so at least she makes sure I pronounce things well, even though I don't understand any of it. Um, and she's a state climatologist here. She's a, a author of past and present uh, uh, chapters in a national climate assessment, um, and she's also a, a, a um, you know climatology professor at the University of Vermont. And you've been getting a lot of attention here lately with all the floods that we have here. Um, and then uh, Marion Waltz is actually with the uh, the state climatology office. She's a the, the chief resilience planner here for the state, you know, and and we're going to be basically working around a use case, you know, that uh, that uh, is associated with one of the projects that she's working on to try to make you know information and services available to to these communities. And so uh, we're going to be doing that. So each one of these folks are going to give a talk. We're going to have a little short Q and A session after that. Then we're going to break up into 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 groups, and we're going to be talking about some questions that that uh, that we're going to be touching on here shortly. Let me just see here. Um, so just real quickly, uh, there's kind of a personal note here. So I moved from Washington D.C. after having been in South Dakota for eight million years, um, and I'm in a, a small town of Johnson. I'm still getting used to this New England town versus village thing. Okay, so I'm I think I'm. So I'm in the town. I'm up high. I'm fine. The village of Johnson got clobbered. Okay, just and the road, Highway 15, leading from my home to this conference, you know, follows the Loyal River, which is one of the rivers that flooded really badly, like the uh, like the Winooski River. And uh, I mean, I gotta say, it was heartbreaking driving here. You know, I drive through this the place where I shop. You know, the supermarket's gone. It's basically wiped out. You know, there's a bridge that crosses the river there. It's an old style. Um, trust bridge it didn't just go over the bridge it almost went over the top of the bridge i mean that's how bad this flood was you know i'm driving by you know places you see people who are living in these low areas all their furniture is out of their house sitting on their front yard drying out you know they have you know bed sheets you know with with help spray painted on it and things like that it's a really heartbreaking scene so i mean it, there couldn't be a more you know timely and pertinent topic for this group to address okay and so i just one, I want to thank you all for attending this, you know, and, and listening to this. And I also want to, uh, you know, uh, thank my panelists who are uh, bringing this very timely, and important discussion in front of this group. And uh, I think at that point, um, Shruti, I'm just going to hand it off to you here. Thank you. Um, I think I need to stop sharing, right? Just. Thank you for your patience. Um, so as Dave uh, mentioned earlier, my name is Shruti Modakriti. I'm the uh, ESIB Community Fellow with the Community Resilience Cluster. So I'll be here um, sharing some challenges and recommendations for earth science to support community resilience. And this is based off the work of the Community Resilience Cluster with all of these wonderful people, uh, two of whom are in the room right here, Arika and uh, Jonathan. Um, so yeah, well, let me just jump in. Um, so what is community resilience and why is it important? We don't have to look any further than the devastating floods that Vermont has experienced recently uh, and the need for communities to be able to bounce back from such uh, disasters. For the purpose of this presentation and the work of the community resilience cluster, uh, we define uh, communities as place-based communities. So community resilience increases a place-based community's capacity to respond and adapt to life-changing environmental dynamics like climate change and natural disasters or floods. So these are some uh, examples of different data needs that uh, communities can have. And as you can see, based on the type of uh, uh, community, the size, um, the problem that they're facing, they might have different resilience needs and data needs. Uh, so an individual, someone who's a resident of a town or a village uh, might need to know uh, the heights of the tidal surge or flood levels to be able to plan for evaluate uh, for evacuation uh, where uh, versus maybe at the county level, uh, they need to have a, a broader view of what's happening uh, so that they can uh, change their plans based on short-term uh, and long -ter longer-term weather patterns. Um, so the point is that based on the community, there are different needs and uh, scales of data that are needed. Um, 
However, there are several challenges in the way that uh, data is, exists and is accessible to communities that pose challenges uh, for communities to make use of this information. So one is inequity in the scientific process. Basically, there's inequity in the way that the uh, knowledge is produced, but then is also made uh, available. Uh, the the um, for example, uh, the scientific decision making process determine the types of information and knowledge that's generated, uh, which means that certain groups might be left out in this process. And you also have uh, inequity in how it's made available. Um, so publicly funded uh, uh, research might be behind a paywall so the communities that are affected can actually access it. Second challenge is gaps in data ethics and governance. So data can be collected from marginalized communities, um, and but it can be exploitative and extractive without the community ever actually seeing the benefits. Um, and improper storage and reuse can violate privacy and perpetuate harm. Another challenge is mismatch of scale and focus, which we saw in the uh, slide earlier, uh, where the type of information that might be needed is not the scale with which it's produced and made available to people. Uh, the third thing is, uh, or sorry, the fourth thing is a lack of actionable information. And this ties into all of the other three challenges. Um, the, the way that the uh, data is made available, there's sort of this assumption that people will find it and use it uh, and sort of make it, um, make it usable for their purposes, putting the onus on communities instead of thinking from a, a community perspective, how is this uh, uh, information and data actually actionable for the communities that we are trying to help. Luckily, there are some, uh, we, we, the Community Resilience Cluster came up with some recommendations. Um, so the first is to integrate the community into the scientific data pathway. Uh, so making sure that the communities that you are trying to help are uh, part of the scientific process from the beginning to the end. So this means increasing co-production with communities. And a key aspect of this is making sure there's mutual respect between scientists and community members. And, and um, another key aspect of this is as, as uh, Dr. Jordan was saying during the uh, plenary session this morning, um, making sure that uh, are you building programs or uh, are you doing research that is actually needed? Or has someone actually asked for this? Another important recommendation is to reconcile openness with self-governance. Um, so this means promoting open principles, but also with ethical considerations. It's not just enough for it to be open. Uh, you, should, you also need to consider the ethical consequences and the context of the data uh, and create ex equitable systems for data governance. So this is where uh, fair and care principles can help with that. The third recommendation is to improve access to data tools. Um, so part of this is promoting usage-based discovery. Um, uh, so thinking about how might one uh, use the data and then building the tools so that uh, uh, it's discoverable for that uh, purpose. Um, incorporating cultural knowledge into the data products. So uh, perhaps local knowledge that is relevant for the community you're trying to help, uh, whether that might be different languages or um, uh, information that people would know on the ground, in incorporating that will make it more accessible and usable for people. Uh, and also fostering data uh, trustworthiness. And I include OpenAQ as an example, uh, as a, a organization that's harmonizing global air quality data. It's open source, so it's really being built by the community and for the, the community. The fourth recommendation is to build capacity to bridge science and place-based community needs. So often the the onus is uh, there's a lot of talk about capacity building within communities, um, you know, uh, improving data and uh, technical literacy. But I think there also needs to be uh, the flip side, which is building um, capacity with scientists and researchers to work with communities. Um, so part of this is training scientists to interact with communities, prioritizing data creation for communities and using transdisciplinary approaches. Um, so what is our responsibility as scientists? What can we do as individuals? Learn to see. So practice seeing how inequities show up within the scientific uh, establishment, what data sets are mis missing, what perspectives are missing. Broaden your audience beyond data for scientists. Think about how others may benefit from your work and be open to new perspectives. 
get involved locally, get your hands dirty and see what it really means to be part of social change. Like you can learn a lot just by being on the ground and seeing how uh, community resilience efforts work. Uh, and be humble, step out of your comfort zone, learn along the way and be open to making mistakes and, and learning as you go along because we are all in this together ultimately. So that's it. It was a brief talk just going over some of the challenges and recommendations on how to work with communities. We'll have more talks that go into specifics and examples. Um, and just wanted to make a quick plug for the community resilience cluster. Um, we would definitely, we would like to understand how the ESIP community currently interacts with communities. And we'd love to, uh, I guess, help us help you. Uh, and if you go to this QR code, you can learn more about the community resilience activities and uh, fill out a brief survey that'll help us um, help you with the work that you're doing with communities. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. And I will pass it off to Robert. We need to download you really quickly. Yes. All right, we're getting faster at this. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Cheatham. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Element 84. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a, a project that goes back probably coming up on 10 years now. Um, called Temperate. Huh. Long lag, maybe. Tried that. Mm -hmm. I probably tried enter. Sure. There it goes. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, how many people are here have heard of Element 84? Well, a bunch of you. Awesome. So uh, we're a women-owned women uh, small business that creates geospatial data processing pipelines, and we build software that helps answer big questions. And one of those that we work on is around uh, climate change. I'm going to talk a little bit about one of these. Uh, I mean, the topic of this session is around the, obviously, climate change is affecting all of us, um, but we don't. Every community doesn't have the same resources uh, necessary to respond. Um, so this is a, an effort that's the result of some funding from the U.S. Department of Energy under its uh, Small Business Innovation Research Program, or SBIR. How many people are familiar with SBIRs? About half of you. So these, this is a program that several federal agencies run, uh, federal agencies in particular that have research budgets. They set up outside under... Um, uh, a congressional mandate set aside about 2% of their extramural research funds for small technology and research businesses uh, to develop new innovative um, products and services. So in 2014, Department of Energy put out a solicitation for uh, SBIRs. And one of the topic areas was, um, uh, was around improving access to IPCC, uh, CMIP and other kinds of climate data. A lot of this data is complex to use, um, net CDF files and things like that, that your average local community would never have a shot at uh, using. Uh, at 2014 terabytes was a large amount of data. Um, they include temperature and precipitation forecasts, uh, but these are not terribly useful unless you can turn those into um, uh, more useful metrics that mean something at the local level. So they invited small businesses to uh, uh, propose ideas, and we were fortunate enough to uh, win one of these. 
So we set out to take that IPCC uh, data and that CDF format, and turn it into cloud native data structures. I won't go into the details of that, but it involved essentially optimizing some open source tools, uh, one of which was called GeoTrellis, uh, to be able to do real time processing with this data, uh, essentially to be able to take for a given location, uh, dive through a very deep time stack, thousands of uh, time shots and the forecasts, um, and then be able to derive uh, useful metrics. And by that, I mean um, extreme heat, cold days, uh, heat waves in a given year expected, high precipitation days, and so on, and do this and be able to plot it on a graph for any location in the world, uh, and then design a user interface for small, mid-sized communities. Uh, this started in 2014. We were we got a phase one, which is essentially a feasibility study, uh, and then we got a phase two to uh, do an implementation. We built out an API. Uh, we eventually released an application called Temperate. We got some supplemental funding from the US Department of Agriculture to adapt this for rural communities. Uh, and we, we had a number of partners, one of which was key to um, being able to work with tribal communities uh, with a, a small consultancy called Prosper Sustainably. So what did we build? Uh, we improved on some of these open source libraries. Uh, we ingested a whole lot of data uh, both IPCC and more downscaled data, built a hazards database, an API, uh, and an actual application. Um, initially, this was aimed at small and mid-sized towns. It created a kind of guided process. It was not like a data explorer that we came up with. It walked you through for your community uh, the process of creating a climate adaptation plan by understanding what hazards you're likely subject to based on your location. Um, and included a database of action strategies that other communities of similar uh, size have had implemented with uh, some success. And uh, as I mentioned, we later adapted it for rural and tribal communities. Uh, we had a pretty key group of folks that worked with us on this. Uh, we had a stakeholder advisory board that included uh, not just local municipal leaders, but um, people from other climate consulting organizations, a, a pretty broad range of folks. Um, we had a lot of support from Amazon Web Services. They essentially funded a lot of the early um, climate data ingestion and storage costs over the course of developing this through their uh, the time they had a climate change um, uh, grants program. And uh, we had a partnership with a nonprofit organization called ICLE. How many people here are familiar with ICLE? Not so many. It's a nonprofit organization. They exist in multiple countries within the United States, essentially a member organization for um, uh, municipal and regional uh, government. And they were really an ideal organization to, uh, to partner with. I'll walk through a few of the screens. It's had a very simple interface. Um, some hazards guidance, as I mentioned, uh, some shared ability to share what you, uh, what you learn and an ability to sign up for uh, help if you get partway through the process and need it. And it was pretty low cost. We designed this to be accessible uh, for even small communities. Uh, there were a lot of things that worked pretty well. Uh, we engaged in a very lengthy uh, user experience discovery and design process. This proved to be really important. Uh, we learned early on that building software was not going to be enough, and we paired that uh, with expert guides. And ICLE was really critical. They had a network of uh, human experts that can help you understand what you're looking at. And uh, pairing the software with people uh, was really important. The low pricing worked. It was an accessible level of pricing for most communities. Uh, this partnership worked. They essentially be uh, uh, my organization uh, didn't have a big sale like product sales and marketing group that could go out and sell this. So Aikley kind of became our sales and marketing partner. They found organizations, uh, communities that wanted to do this kind of work, and then worked with us to get people signed up, often in cohorts. Uh, we built something that was pretty scalable, and in other words, we could add new people to it at pretty low incremental cost. We built a climate API that drove it, and it was more useful than we expected. We got a lot of people. We made it available for free, and we got a lot of people that just signed up and banged away at the API for, for a variety of purposes. And we served several dozen communities over the course of a few years, uh, some of which were, as I mentioned, uh, added as cohorts, groups uh, that all were uh, onboarded at the same time. And we ended up building a climate hazards database that had utility apart from uh, the actual temperate project. 
but there were a ton of failures along the way, uh, one of which was almost existential. So we were given this grant by the Department of Energy uh, that was to address a need. That need was commonly understood across the federal government. And simultaneously, NOAA and the Department of Energy were building the exact same application and they released it for free just as we were about to roll it out. So um, that wasn't gonna work. Uh, we had to uh, regroup, um, uh, kind of reorient where we were going and that's what got us to the actual uh, temperate application. Um, one thing we learned was people did need help developing a plan, but once they had a plan, they weren't really interested in remaining signed up. So if we had a subscription model uh, and that generated, I covered the cost of running the application, um, but it wasn't a, didn't turn into a sustainable business model. Uh, Re-ingesting data as it grew with each CMIT uh, IPCC data release was became a bigger and bigger lift. And simultaneously, lots and lots of other tools were being uh, developed by a whole range of people. Uh, and our ICLEI champion left ICLEI had moved on to other uh, bigger and better things, um, uh, which caused them to uh, uh, decide they didn't want to continue to uh, support this. Um, and reflecting on all this, because it's been almost 10 years uh, since we started engaging with this, um, there are a lot of things we learned. I think the community input and user discovery process were incredibly powerful. Uh, talking to people early on, not assuming we knew what uh, we wanted. We had been burned bad thinking we knew what the market wanted, someone else creating it uh, and having to start over. Uh, this was just incredibly powerful. And I think the kinds of user experience, discovery, and design work uh, that our team at uh, Element 84 does is continues to uh, pay dividends. Software and data are not enough. Uh, communities also need guides. As a software person, I like to think that if we create great software, people will use it and it'll be awesome. And that's just not the case in a lot of situations. Um, big waves of federal funding, we're about to go through another one right now, create a lot of overlapping efforts and they are all impossible to coordinate and that's okay. It ends up creating lots of different things, some of which are going to make it and some of which are not. And I think great initiatives are tied to great people. And that's a way of a, a nod toward all my colleagues who helped build and design this and the folks at ICLEI and Prosperous Sustainably. But it also means that when those great people move on, uh, sometimes uh, things don't work as well as you might have, uh, as you might have hoped. That is my very brief introduction to Temperate and the lessons that we learned. But uh, thanks very much. I'm looking forward to talking to all of you after this. Okay, I'm ready. Got for that one already. Is this yours? Yeah. I know, I know, right now. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. I'll just say this guy. Let's make sure that this guy is going to be the Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Did I just wake you up? By the time we get to Marion, this should all flow perfectly. So good morning. My name is Leslie Andupini Giroux, and I would like to welcome you to the state of Vermont. I think you got a baptism by water. Um, if you flew in, you probably did not see a lot because of how the flight paths are. If you drove in, you probably did see some of that very, very unfortunate damage. And so what I'm going to do today is to sort of put together a lot of the hats that I wear as a, a professor here at the University of Vermont, as a Vermont state climatologist, as sitting on way too many committees, and using a lot of that intersectionality to show what 
doing climate preparedness for small communities looks like here across the state. So as a climatologist, I could not resist putting in some of these pictures in here. You arrived and you did not get the rain, but you did see a lot of haze in the atmosphere because we're getting a lot of smoke coming, not just from the fires from Quebec, but also all the way from British Columbia, right? So that's, that's this is from yesterday. If we go back exactly a week ago, this is what the um, the GOES satellite looked like. And you're seeing that um, swirling in of all of these storm systems. I shudder to actually touch anything on here for, for fear of it kind of skipping ahead. So I might just actually walk across there and point some stuff out to you. Yeah, I know I'm the comic relief in the room here. So we're looking at this pattern. You see how those storms have sort of stagnated across this, the central part of Vermont, which is where you, you had a lot of that really heavy precipitation because it's sort of like wringing itself out over this really, really complex topography. And so scenes from... 12 years ago, as a result of Tropical Storm Irene moving through, are unfortunately being repeated again. And when we um, put all of the different things that we're seeing and collecting and, and the new flood heights and crests and so on together, we'll probably see some of these. But this is to give us a sense of what it means to, to walk in a small community and to, to sort of live this on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Because Two weeks ago, I was being interviewed by the media for talking about the drought across the state, for talking about El Nino, for talking about wildfires, right? And then we pivot really, really quickly because that's one of the characteristics of climate variability and change in the Northeast, that going on a dime between dry conditions to wet conditions. And you're hearing farmers like, weren't we just about to irrigate and now we have fields that are flooded up to here, right? And so this going back and forth that you're seeing across in here, tropical ice storm, I is on the lower right. It set those flood peaks of record now for Lake Champlain. And just before that, in, in May, we also had some flood peaks that had been set. Okay. So if I look at as of yesterday, this is what the Lake Champlain gauges look like. And that red line shows you the current um, up to date. Um, part of the hydrograph. The middle line is the, the median value. The green line at the bottom is the, the lowest on record and the, the purple line is, is the, the highest. So you can see that in fact of, of the, the storms from the last week or so causing the lake levels to rise as a response to all of those rivers coming in, in here. So my presentation is about the work that I did with one town in the state of, of Vermont called Underhill. And you're probably wondering where Underhill is and why Underhill. And Underhill, um, just to get you situated a little bit, is one of the largest producers of maple syrup across the state. And so here's a, a sugar maple leaf and you're seeing a lot of the leaf scorch around the edges in there because it was subject to drought. So we're looking at how some of these things play out because it's important from a carbon sequestration perspective, but also from a, an economic perspective from the livelihood across the state itself. So um, Dave mentioned where he, he lives now, and I'm going to try this. Are you seeing my mouse move? Okay, I could have done this before instead of providing all that comic relief. So Dave lives across here in, in Johnson, right? Took him about an hour to get here. We're across here in, in Burlington. And the road that Dave was talking about is this um, state road called Route 15, which you do pass through Underhill to get up to, to Dave's house. So you're looking at the complex topography around there. And if you look at it, you're seeing um, a lot of the pattern that shapes Vermont, which is a lot of mountains on one side and the valleys in the middle and where the roads, they're usually right next to the, the, the rivers themselves. And so this is the sort of terrain shot. If I showed you the satellite shot, it'll give you a, a more concrete sense of what we mean when we're talking about villages and towns across the state of Vermont itself. And Underhill has about 3,000 people. So when we say small communities, we're talking about anywhere from six people all the way up to like 3,000 people. So small is, is relative and we're, we're learning how that plays out across the board itself. So the project that I'm, I'm gonna talk about really, really quickly is a partnership between my class. I teach a class called Climatology and Natural Hazards. Uh, and we worked directly with the town of Underhill last year because they had some specific needs in updating their, their town hazard mitigation plan that they didn't have the answers for. So I volunteered my class 
So to work with them directly and that working alongside a community partner is a, a pedagogy called service learning where the partner specifies what they need and then I tweak the class to actually help to uh, address that need itself. It's a lot of work, but it's also very, very fulfilling and the students are freaking out because there is no set, you know, like, do this, do this, do this, and get your A. It's like, no, we have to come up with, with solutions and ideas that are a little bit different from what you've done before in the last four years that you've been here. So we're looking at that and using all of the different techniques that allow us to do a really good and meaningful service learning project. And part of that is actually getting out into the community. So you're looking at this here, like I said, um, sugar mapling is really, really um, important in, in Underhill here. And this is to give us a sense of how those roads and rivers sort of come together. So where you see this road here on the right and the river next to it here, okay? On the, the satellite shot here, this is where it is. So we were standing literally right here. This is the road. And this is that little creek here that empties into, as Dave was saying, the Lamoille, that creek that drives right along Route 15 here. So we're looking at these and we're looking at how this sort of plays out. So sometimes elevation difference between a road and a river is literally this, okay? So it's very easy to overtop the banks in here. So working with the communities, doing this deep dive, one of the things that you'll notice is a lot of the roads and rivers run north-south in here. So that sets up a, a challenge for when you've got a lot of precipitation coming in. And how do we identify what those risks are? A lot of whiteboarding, a lot of really, really creative uh, thinking that the students came up with. And so knowing that Underhill has a lot of that north-south, both topography, roads and rivers, it's something that plays out again and again across the state of Vermont, where this is to give us a sense of that proximity uh, between your infrastructure and your, and your rivers, so that you do get these places where you've got repeat occurrences of flooding taking place, which sets up again challenges, not just from a, a local town level, but also from a, a, a state level as well. So I'm going to ask my colleague at the uh, Agency of Transportation if he came up with another map that looks exactly like this, because he created this when we had Irene. And what you're seeing here is he superimposed all of the roads that were closed or flooded or affected in some way as a result of Irene with the ones that were affected in 1927. And they match like this. OK, because the roads have moved, the rivers have meandered that much so that vulnerability still exists today. So to do this, um, the class needed to, to partner with a lot of, of other uh, external agencies. And so we, we partnered with um, ESRI um, do, using the Survey123 tool to go out into the field and actually collect a lot of data that way. Uh, the town of Underhill itself. And sorry, Robert, we partnered with the Climate Resilience Toolkit. OK. All right. So the Climate Resilience Toolkit, um, Ned Garden is the one who put together a lot of the, the sort of protocols on, on, on how you do this. How do you step through and figure out what your hazards are, come up with your vulnerabilities so that you can do an assessment of some sort. And so you've seen this slide before from, from Robert. It allows you to put this in by zip code so that you can actually um, get a sense of, of what your threshold values are, how much precipitation would be exceeded in the future and so forth. Um, historical conditions on the left, projections out to uh, um, the, the middle part of the century to the end of the century out to the right. So we're able to bring some of that in here and again, step through some of these workflows so that you can see what it would look like for um, a specific town, in this case, the town of Underhill itself. So like I said, really, really messy, but it allowed the students to really grapple with things like social vulnerability, with economic vulnerability, with who is at the end of, of which road and would not get a, a warning in the case of a flood hazard, for example, which is critical if we're going to be um, helping communities to, to shift the, the paradigm in their um, vulnerability issues. So that was one piece. Those are all the federal resources that I would bring to bear. On the local level, we also had the Vermont um, Climate Action Plan, which um, is part of what Marion's going to be talking about next and some of the things that came out of that. Because in part of that plan, uh, putting together all of these hazards for the state, but also putting together the, the projected changes in the hazards. And so on the right-hand side, you're seeing some work from my colleague, um, Jay Schaefer, in what those projections might look like for various hazards, including flooding, including droughts, and different types of ice storms and so forth. So we get a sense of which ones we, we need to sort of prioritize a little bit. 
So all of this came together really nicely and we share that back with the town itself. Um, the University of Vermont did a little um, article that featured what the lessons learned from the student perspective as well as the um, town perspective. So a little bit of snippets from the report itself. And the key part, because we're, we're serving communities. So the key part in all of this is what the town got out of our collaboration, right? So one of the things that they got out was they want stuff that's geospatial in format. Text is fine, but they would love to see things that are either GIS-based or remote sensing-based so they can actually kind of zoom into various levels and, and overlay those with the work that's already been done in the town so that it becomes useful, okay? So that's one piece in there. Um, a lot of the state of Vermont focuses on extreme water on the heavy side, and there's less uh, focus on other aspects like air quality, like droughts. And so um, allowing the students to bring that into the conversation brought that um, into the, this, the mitigation plan that the town was working on. And then a lot of the work is, is always done at the census level. And the, the students allow them to see that you need to get down to the people level, to the neighborhood level, if you're actually going to make a difference. And then the last piece in all of this is who, who are you going to call when something happens? How are you going to make sure that people get the communications that they need? And so some of the, the tools that need to be addressed in here. So all of those pieces that I learned, I actually sort of took with me when I was invited to the White House um, in, in March to talk to this, this forum that they had created on campus and community scale solutions to see if there's anything in the Vermont situation that could be scaled up or are there pieces that we need to sort of think about uh, a little bit differently. And so as part of that White House visit, I came up with this uh, way of thinking of how do we serve communities? How does this kind of fit across the board? So I, I think a lot of folks who are attending this conference are across on, on this right-hand side here. We're service providers, we're data providers, we're, we're getting information, tools, visualizations out to communities. Um, folks like Underhill are going to be across in here, where they've got a specific need, an articulated need. And then folks like myself, who are state climatologists, who are both scientists, but also work directly with um, communities, are folks in the middle who are trying to do this portal stuff in here. And so I'm going to leave you with um, another diagram, because I love doing diagrams. I'm going to leave you with this last diagram here, which I created for the um, Climate Action Plan, if you'd like to take a look at it. It's my, I call it my do no harms diagram because it brings together everything that I have learned in how does governance play into what are we thinking about from a hazard perspective? Are there places in Vermont that should or should not be developed or lived in with all of the things that fit together as the peoples of Vermont, including our indigenous peoples and the ways of knowing that they bring us in enriching all of the things that we need to do as we step forward. So with that, Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn this over to my dear colleague, Marion. Hi, everyone. Thanks for inviting me to be here today. My name is Marion Wolls. I'm the Resilience and Adaptation Coordinator for the Vermont Climate Action Office. Nice ringtone. <laughs> Someone really, really needs you to answer your phone. Well, I'm here to, to share with you today a project that we're working on in the state of Vermont um, to build a municipal vulnerability index for communities to use to assess their vulnerabilities to climate change and where that intersects with social, economic, and other vulnerability factors. We're building on a lot of the work that Leslie Ann spoke to in her work with the town of Underhill and sort of the expertise that she brings to this work. Um, and I'm excited to share this with you. 
And I think after this discussion or presentation today, we're going to break out into some small groups and have you all brainstorm some solutions to the challenges we're facing and sort of some of the input that we're learning from communities as we build this tool. And now, do I just wait? Okay. Well, while we wait. Um, so uh, an overview of this project, we are still very much in the process of building this tool. And it's funny to be standing here talking to you all about tools, as we've heard a few times that there are so many tools out there. What's the point and, and sort of uh, benefit of building a new tool? But I think as Leslie Ann said, and in learning from small communities, we're really seeing the need to one, look at vulnerabilities, both sort of from the social, biophysical, economic aspects, overlaid with climate hazard vulnerabilities in a geospatial format that allows really small communities that have limited capacity to do climate planning to understand what their vulnerabilities are and build that into their day-to-day -day processes. There we go. Um, so we've kicked off this project. Um, it was actually a requirement in the Global Warming Solutions Act, which was a law that the Vermont legislature passed in late 2020. Um, this Global Warming Solutions Act um, was a huge piece of legislation that codified greenhouse gas reduction targets into requirements for the state of Vermont to meet at a 2025, 2030, and 2050 timescale. If we as a state don't meet those, the Agency of Natural Resources can be sued by anyone. So there's cause of action included in that Global Warming Solutions Act. But it not only addresses greenhouse gas reductions, but also requires work on adaptation and resilience with a, uh, a, a very detailed focus on how rural communities can sort of adapt, understanding that the pressures of sort of climate change and the tr transitions we need to make at a community scale will place on these really small scale communities that we work with in Vermont. So in the Global Warming Solutions Act, it required the development of a municipal vulnerability index to look at a range of social, economic, and biophysical factors and how those overlay and intersect with climate hazards. The language in the law was a little specific and asked that we looked at population, average age, employment, grand list trends, active and civic public organizations, and distance to emergency shelters. In this Global Warming Solutions Act, it established a Vermont Climate Council and charged the Climate Council with writing Vermont's first climate action plan, which was passed uh, in late 2021. That work really took, uh, took a look at what we needed to understand in terms of adaptation and resilience and how we could build a tool that's a little bit more broadly focused in the language in that Global Warming Solutions Act to really highlight community vulnerabilities, particularly those focused on factors such as race, ethnicity, age, income, education, and geographic location. And the aim of building this tool is to help municipalities, so at that sort of municipal small scale, understand what factors are impacting their risk to climate change hazards, again, across social, economic, and biophysical factors. The intent is that this tool can be used to help communities develop current planning requirements. Um, towns are uh, can write hazard mitigation plans, which opens up funding opportunities for them post-disaster. We're seeing a lot of focus on that now following this last week's flooding. Towns uh, write local and, and at a regional scale energy plans that look at um, both energy resilience and transition off of fossil fuels. And towns also work on their municipal plans, some do capital planning, and we're looking at how can we build a tool that helps communities in their current planning efforts think about climate change in the context of their day-to-day -day work. We're also understanding that this tool will be really helpful to help um, state agencies and other decision makers at the state and the municipal level prioritize climate-related funding, understanding that we have a huge influx of, coming, of funding coming into the state. Um, and that we need to be prepared to, to really look at where can we prioritize projects um, that have the biggest bang for their buck in terms of reducing um, uh, our risk to climate change hazards. We are working with a contractor on this project and it's being led out of uh, our office at the Climate Action Office at the Agency of Natural Resources together with a partnership in the Vermont Climate Council. Um, we have a group of folks that are helping lead this work. Um, and we kicked off this work in March of this year uh, with the intent to wrap it up into uh, later next, um, early next year. Uh, the process for this, uh, we're looking uh, really at engaging with stakeholders beginning and early on in the process to understand where they might want to see certain data sets, data layers, um, how they understand their climate vulnerabilities and how we can help heighten that in a geospatial tool. Also understanding what barriers exist for local communities, and I'll get into that a bit later on, and how we can break those down to make a tool that's more useful um, at a municipal scale. But as I talk about tools, um, I don't want to uh, minimize that we have a lot of tools in Vermont and outside. I think many of them have been spoken to today already that highlight some components of social, economic, and climate vulnerabilities. We have the Health Department's Vermont Social Vulnerability Index. 
our Agency of Transportation's Resilience Planning Tool, Vermont uh, Agency of Natural Resources BioFinder, uh, Vermont State Highway Flood Risk Map, and at uh, um, a sort of federal partner level, the CMRA, Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool, Disaster Occurrence Disaster Atlas. Marion, we get the idea. There's a lot of tools out there. So what's really the benefit of creating this Municipal Vulnerability Index? And that's actually one of the questions we asked as we went out and did stakeholder engagement with community partners, state agency partners, and other stakeholders in this process. And what we've started to hear is all of these tools and the many others that we looked at in terms of background research for this project highlight specific social, economic, infrastructure, vulnerability components, but there's no easy way to see all those together and then understand how those are impacted by climate hazards and the risks associated with an increase of flooding, drought, um, you know, heavy precipitation in the winter time. So our idea or the intent of this tool is to really layer some of those social, biophysical, economic um, impacts and vulnerabilities with the hazards that we see in Vermont so that municipalities have a place to go to understand what might they need to be thinking of when they're looking at vulnerabilities of their roadway infrastructure or mobile home parks in their communities who may be more vulnerable to climate change. And what are those underlying vulnerabilities that we need to be thinking about and lifting up in our planning and project implementation efforts. So we've started a stakeholder engagement process um, and actually just wrapped it up last month, uh, really focusing on um, small rural communities in Vermont, um, and then the partners that serve those communities. We uh, developed a stakeholder engagement plan that included 10 interviews with select communities, as well as representatives of uh, community-based organizations that work with those most vulnerable uh, communities based on race, ethnicity, um, economic factor factors that I highlighted on the last a couple slides ago. We also did some broader stakeholder engagement, sort of your traditional, what we're good at in state government, broad meetings to facilitate input from a number of municipalities and our regional planning commissions, which sort of serve as our quasi-governmental county support. We don't have county government in Vermont, so we have a really small scale uh, level of work and capacity that exists at a municipal level. Through that stakeholder engagement and through examining uh, uh, tools that have been developed in the past, um, we've developed sort of uh, five domains, which are sort of the broad categorization of vulnerabilities that we want to look at in this municipal vulnerability index. You'll see those up on the slide here. And that's sort of the framing that we're going into this, thinking about what layers and framework do we need to put into this tool in order for it to be usable and sort of all encompassing for this work with communities. So as I said about stakeholder engagement, we've, we looked at um, sort of who are end users of this tool and then where do we need to focus some targeted outreach to ensure that we're lifting up those voices that aren't traditionally heard in some stakeholder engagement processes that you know, state government has conducted in the past. We know that the primary end users of this tool are intended to be sort of municipal planners, um, many of whom are actually volunteers that serve on their municipal planning commissions, um, design review boards, et cetera as well as regional planning commissions, which support many of our small communities in doing planning um, for sort of all of the planning efforts that I described earlier. We also focused our stakeholder engagement on affected populations, really focusing on organizations that serve with or work with communities that are disproportionately impacted by climate change impacts, ensuring that we can lift up their voices to, to understand how this tool may or may not be useful and where there may be roadblocks that we need to be addressing in the development of this. We also know, as I highlighted earlier, there are a lot of tools out there already, many of which are housed and, and sort of maintained by the state of Vermont government. How can we intersect and work with those municipal vulnerability index, what we're calling tool partners, to ensure that this tool overlaps and um, is beneficial in, in sort of furthering some of the efforts that, that other folks are working on. And then, of course, the last group is state staff who are responsible for the ultimate maintenance of this tool. Um, that's really important to, to keep in mind and, and work with them. So we are now at the point where we've finished conducting our stakeholder engagement. So still very much in the beginning process of developing this tool. We evaluated existing tools, conducted uh, multiple rounds of stakeholder engagement, and are now moving into developing the framework and methods for this tool with the intent of circling back with a lot of those stakeholders after we've developed that. As we were talking about stakeholder engagement, it was really important. I think you know we've heard reference to um, ensuring that we're not extracting data and not showing how it can be useful to communities, ensuring that we have folks understand where their voices are being heard. And so taking their input sort of before we develop the tool, asking them what might be useful, where there might be roadblocks. And once we've developed a framework for that tool, going back to those stakeholders to say, here's what we've learned from you. Here's where we've been able to incorporate your input. Here's maybe where we haven't and, that, and here's why. To ensure that we're you know, allowing a feedback loop of engagement with these communities and we're not just taking their input, building a tool with no further reflection in the process. 
And that will happen a couple of times, but we have a key point that wasn't showing up in this graphic. So I highlighted it with the uh, red arrow there. So as I said, we've wrapped up stakeholder engagement the past month or so and moving are moving into um, uh, sort of the framework and methods development for this tool. But I wanted to highlight some key considerations and feedback that we are thinking about based on that stakeholder engagement we've heard that might be important for you all to think about in your work with small communities and that you can help us brainstorm solutions to with the discussion questions. So the first and I think key piece, and Leslie Ann has highlighted this uh, in her work with Underhill, a lot of the communities in the state that we work with have limited to no capacity to work with a tool like this, to even be thinking about actually writing climate adaptation plans. It's not something that many communities are doing in the state. I think I know of three, uh, mostly with larger communities that have paid municipal staff. But to give you an example, we did a number of interviews with municipalities, the smallest of which is a town of 126 people. And this is, uh, you know, fully volunteer run efforts where they are just every year struggle to be able to write their climate or excuse me, their hazard mitigation plans. And so when we came to them and said, hey, we're interested in developing this tool, what might be useful for you? Are there other tools that you use data that you find useful? The answer is no, no, and no, and I don't think I'm going to have the capacity to do that. So we're really thinking about one, how do we develop a tool that is scalable and useful for the multiple sort of levels of capacity that we see needs for in our communities? But also, I think as Robert identified and others, how do we develop user guides, training, and sort of that long-term capacity building that perhaps may have to sit on the shoulders of state government or sit on the shoulders of some of our community partners, um, regional planning commissions, to be able to really help these small scale, these small communities that don't have capacity to do this tool, uh, use this tool themselves. We have an issue of scale of data. I think Leslie Ann highlighted it uh, in her presentation about sub census level. A lot of the data that we have access to is at the census track level, which in Vermont is just can oftentimes scale multiple municipal boundaries and may not be useful when you're thinking about planning at a municipal level. In talking to communities, we've spoken with road foremen who have said it would be really useful if I could see, you know, uh, repeat damages of this particular road and where that might impact a neighborhood. And in, uh, in many cases, we don't have access to that level of data. Um, but we also want to be looking at this as a state level tool to help policy and decision makers at the state level think about prioritization of resources at a state scale. So how do we sort of balance that scale of data and need, understanding that in some cases we just may not have access to that data currently, but want to build a system where we can fold that in in future efforts. We're calling this a municipal vulnerability index and have heard through stakeholder engagement that that. Uh, really highlighting vulnerability isn't always the best way to go about thinking about climate adaptation and resilience planning. We need to be reframing this as potentially risk and opportunity and where communities can understand where they might um, have more risk based on underlying social, economic, or natural factors. And then what are the actual opportunities to address those vulnerabilities? And so ensuring that we're framing that both in the development of this tool and any user guides and training that we have coming out of this process is a really important and key feature that we um, heard through stakeholder engagement and are trying to hold up. Uh, I think as many of us have heard and, and we've talked about a bit, there are a lot of tools out there, but that doesn't necessarily translate to action. And we're hearing it a lot in our stakeholder engagement that it's helpful to have this tool and resource, but I want to be able to click and understand that, uh, you know, I may have flooding vulnerability or we may actually be in a food desert in this area that is an underlying factor that may contribute to climate vulnerabilities. What are the actions as a small community that I can take to do that work? We have a, a tangential, a sort of a separate project that we're working on um, to try and connect that action. But I think I challenge you all um, as service providers and folks who are working in this data space to really think about how do we communicate this data and make it actionable? Again, circling back to that capacity issue for communities that really don't have that capacity to, to maybe make that jump themselves. We need to be providing the resources and the, and the sort of action steps to do that. One of the interesting conversations we've been having a lot in and focusing a little bit on that sort of vulnerability versus opportunity, how do we also highlight the resilience capacity of our small communities? And this is something we are seeing louder than ever this past week um, with the flooding that many Vermont communities experienced. There is an, uh, an outsurge of, of volunteers and sort of boots on the ground folks who are working to help communities get back up and running to get our, our, our businesses back up and running um, to hope that we can sort of lessen the economic impact. From a data level, what are the actual metrics that we can use and show that sort of resilience capacity at a local level? We've been hearing that, you know, even if there's maybe data sets that aren't at the state level that we could show in particular areas, it may help communities think about what sorts of actions 
social structures, networks that they could set up at a community level to sort of highlight that resilience capacity. So in thinking about sort of what data we want to highlight in a geospatial tool, what maybe are some metrics for community resilience that we should be thinking about um, at a state level? And then the last piece, I think, um, again, we're seeing a lot just based on the flooding that happened this last week. Um, and, and, and knowing that this, you know, it wasn't a named storm, it was just a lot of rain that fell on some really saturated ground. Um, and we are going to continue to see that happen on a more and more frequent level based on climate, on climate change and those projections. How do we ensure that the data that's communicated in the tool, the hazard overlays that we're hoping to build, take into account both the historical data, but those climate projections for precipitation, for drought, for high heat, um, and those other climate hazards that we're, that we're going to see in the future. So ensuring that we're balancing that and, and communicating that in a way that, that makes sense as an actionable for local communities. So next steps in this process, as I said, we've wrapped up stakeholder engagement, at least this first component of it. We're developing the climate vulnerability factors for inclusion in the municipal vulnerability index, starting to talk about the actual framework and methods based on what we've learned from stakeholder engagement, meeting with our tool partners, and then we'll be looping back with stakeholders later on in this process, developing the tool and then doing some beta testing um, with the hopes of publishing it early next year. So that is all I have, um, but I think I'm going to pull up our discussion questions and the idea is that we'll break out into some discussion uh, groups and focus on sort of what you all might be hearing and learning in your work with communities, um, where maybe you have some questions for us. Um, but are we doing Q&A first? Well, why don't you just go ahead and just kind of go through these. Okay, so, okay, uh, sure. Um, so Leslie and I worked on some discussion questions for you all, um, thinking about sort of the case study of how, what we're doing in Vermont and developing a municipal vulnerability index, but I think also reflecting on what um, everyone has shared from their presentations and, and questions you all may have and how we can help um, sort of continue this conversation about um, data and, and sort of helping with climate preparedness in small communities. Um, so, so uh, five questions here. What are some stumbling blocks that perhaps you've encountered in your work with small communities? Are there any su successful geospatial stories that you've encountered in your work that we could reflect on and learn from? Um, how, when, and what types of community and stakeholder engagement methods would be um, helpful to uncover climate-related vulnerabilities? What types of questions would you all be asking? How should we be approaching this challenge of scale of data and usability? And then what are some of the best practices in terms of coding, platform design, scaffolding that you think could lead to the creation and use of a simple intuitive tool? Great, do you want me to leave this up? Yeah, just leave that up. Sure. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Yes. So real quick, uh, we were going to have a Q&A session, but I think just given the time we have left, maybe we should just kind of like dive in. We wanted to have some breakout groups. We're going to break into four that are going to go over these questions. Each each group is going to go over all questions. Okay. And so since we have a limited amount of time left, uh, I think what we're going to do is just try to get everybody back. Can we just say 1230 and just do a quick one and just People will just be like five minutes for late for lunch. That's okay. So just, we're going to have each one of our panelists here, minus me. I'm just going to wander. Okay. <laughs> just don't call me late for lunch. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, so uh, so each one of our panelists here is going to take uh, a group. And I think we're just going to divide the room into four. You know, so um, so Shruti, if you wanted to have that, uh, the back corner there. Uh, Marion, if uh, you could uh, talk with these folks over here. Uh, Robert. You take that and then Leslie Ann, could you have this group right here? Okay, right. So uh, yeah, what we'd like you to do is just spend the next, uh, I guess what, 25-ish minutes or so, uh, just going over these questions and then you know providing some answers. And we'll just spend a very quick uh, few minutes after you're done going over the results and uh, release everybody for lunch. So once again, all right, so we went. All right thanks. Go ahead and, uh, okay. So we have that advantage. Thank you. Right. Okay, folks, uh, I think what we're gonna do here is we're probably just gonna wrap up right now. Or we are gonna wrap up right now. And so the panelists here will take all the results of these questions and we will collate them you know, later, okay? And then we'll report back, you know, um, I guess asynchronously here. So real quick um, to, to get everyone's attention. Uh, hello, folks. I know you are, I could tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And since you have her as a resource, you might as well take advantage of it as long as you can, because she's fantastic. Um, just real quick though, before we, we take off here for lunch, which is waiting for us, I just wanted to give a round of applause to our fantastic panelists here who really have put this together. So thank you. All right, All right folks. Um, so 
this room is going to be available for a while. If you want to continue, that's fine. Some of us are going to be going to lunch. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks again.